late January 1993, a few excruciating days since the Australian glossy magazine New Idea published the full transcript of Prince Charles and Mistress Camilla's embarrassing telephone conversation. She was tabloid toast. She was the wicked witch of the East, you know. The press worldwide continues to publish the tawdry details. I'm going to press the tit. You're right, darling. God, I wish you were pressing mine. God, I wish I was harder and harder. Oh, darling. The British public is in total shock. The palace, blindsided, is yet to comment, and Prince Charles is nowhere to be seen. Where's Camilla, the woman who had been enjoying an illicit and suddenly headline-making affair with the future king? Published in the top-selling Australian women's magazine, New Idea, allegedly detailed probably the most intimate conversation ever recorded by a member of the royal family. The She's in the kitchen of her Wiltshire home, sat at the table, smoking cigarettes, so staring out of the window, and struggling to make sense of the explosive events of the last few days. At the end of the driveway of the home she still shares with her husband, Andrew, are hordes of frenzied reporters and photographers with long lenses, desperate for a word or a glimpse of Mrs Parker Bowles, the mistress of the Prince of Wales. Already labelled the most hated woman in Britain, Camilla bore the heavy burden alone, according to her friend Cathy Lett. To suddenly find yourself as public enemy number one and to be such a hate figure and be kind of on the dartboard of the national consciousness must have been horrific, the witch hunt. <laughs> you know, they practically had her on a broomstick you know, at the time. Charles is not only a husband to Diana, but also the father of two young sons, their boys, William, then 11, and Harry, nine. Camilla, too, has a family, older, but just as vulnerable to the public gaze. Tom, now studying at Oxford University, and Laura, still at school. How will this impact on them? For private conversations to be made public was just the most horrendous thing. Christina Kiriakou, Charles's former communications secretary, says the couple had public pressures to face even before this headline grabber. The sanctity of marriage is something that the head of the church has to take incredibly seriously. Surely it's now game over for Charles and Camilla. Charles to acknowledge the public wrath, Camilla to face a more private but equally judgmental husband. Not quite so fast, says Phil Craig, co-author of the best-selling book, Diana, Story of a Princess. The clue, he says, is with the tape. What you hear is a couple who are clearly very much in love and need each other. And everybody focuses on the sexual and the salacious part of the tape. But what's really interesting about it is the preamble. He is trailing a new speech and she is giving him supportive comments and telling him how clever he is and how grateful people should be to him for what he does. Diana wasn't like that. Diana would have told him what she thought, and it might not have been very complimentary. He likes to do things a certain way. He likes to be treated a certain way. Camilla was more than happy to be that supportive partner, as you can hear in the tape. And Camilla clearly is the sort of partner that he needs. Despite all that she stands to lose, Camilla, motivated by loyalty, possibly, and love, most probably, chooses to do and say nothing. And in doing so, she unwittingly sets herself up as the perfect foil to one person in the British royal family who has been empowered by the whole of this scandal. Diana, Princess of Wales. This is episode two of Sky News's Queen Camilla for the love of Charles. I'm Kay Burley. The royal family is now engulfed by the crisis. Diana has become the force to be reckoned with. I think you have to remember just how bad things looked after the publication of the Camilla Gate tape for Charles and for Camilla. It was a shocking moment and a moment of total vindication for Diana. What she chooses to do next will shape not only her future, but that of the whole of the House of Windsor. For better or for worse, the lives of Camilla and Diana and their fortunes are now inextricably linked, as Phil Craig remembers. She'd written in her book 
the one that she more or less dictated to Andrew Morton, and she revealed the relationship. Charles and his supporters had denied it, had said that Camilla is a friend and Diana is paranoid. That was the line that was being spread. And so suddenly here's this tape, and it's obvious that not only are Charles and Camilla a lot more close than friends, and this was really, really bad for Charles. And, you know, Diana became a kind of global icon of female victimhood at this point, quite rightly. Every woman that had ever been cheated on and then lied about and gaslit, as we now say, sympathised with Diana very much, and I think many of them still do. Weeks turn into months. Camilla continues to lay low. She struggles to eat and the pounds fall away. She can be increasingly found with her mother, whose health is in decline. It must have been very hard to go in public a few months after those tapes came out. Certainly there was a suggestion that people would start throwing tampons at Camilla and things like that. Diana's own affair with the cavalry officer James Hewitt had ended only months earlier, after several years. But that revelation was nothing compared to the scandal of Charles and Camilla. For the vast majority of the British public, as well as Sky News royal correspondent Simon McCoy, there was only one side you could possibly take. Most people were thinking about Diana and the effect this was all going to have on her. And people were very upset. Phone-in programme after phone-in programme had people saying, poor Diana this, poor Diana that. And of course that's true because everybody was pointed to Camilla as as that evil woman and the Rottweiler, as Diana herself had called her. But hindsight, I think, can be a little kinder on those directly involved. And and no one comes out of it incredibly well in that, you know, Charles was committing adultery. Diana was too. Camilla was. But Camilla's husband was as well. We're talking about a complicated time. And it was about to become even more complicated. The royal family has split into two groups... Camp Charles and Camilla, and Camp Diana. The public, with the guidance of an ever-hungry media, would fall in line with one camp or the other, but not both. Phil Craig again. Diana was probably a bit more of a um, a kind of slow and ranger than Camilla, and more the the country house set. I mean, the difference really, I suppose, is that Diana had a a kind of love for the cameras and a a way of attracting the limelight and and, and enjoyed that and then tried later to turn that to... In, in, in unusual directions for Royal at the time, the causes that she embraced. Um, it's hard to see Camilla being that sort of person. Diana's friends were younger. They put, they were young officers in the military. They were stockbrokers. And they run, tore around London in, in, in golf GTIs. And they drank too much and they were rather loud and they liked going skiing. And that was her world. Camilla moved in a world of slightly older, more worldly wise people into these country house parties where they would ride and hunt and jumping out of bed with each other. Through the tabloid coverage, Diana becomes even more relatable, even more popular in the eyes of her already adoring public. At the same time, Camilla and Charles' popularity sinks ever deeper. Something will have to be done. The War of the Waleses is about to be born. It's 18 months since the world learned about Charles and Camilla's affair. In all of that time, neither have made any comment nor given any explanation about the true nature of their relationship. The narrative has instead been left to Diana and the press to shape. But both Charles and the palace know that he can't remain a mere bystander to his own story. His future succession to the throne may well depend on restoring his reputation with Camilla, not Diana, by his side. He turns to a friend and broadcaster, Jonathan Dimbleby. Together, they develop a documentary to mark Charles's 25th year as Prince of Wales. A documentary in which they will also address, for the first time, allegations about Charles's relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles. It began like a Hollywood epic. Charles' decision to be tracked by a camera for a year was a gamble. On the 29th of June, 1994, Charles, the private man, the public role was broadcast on ITV. An opportunity to perhaps clear the air in front of an audience of 14 million people about his relationship with Camilla. A chance to set the record straight. He first begins to suggest that speculation about an affair with Camilla is just that, speculation. Mrs Bugabills is a great friend of mine. I have 
a large number of friends that I'm terribly lucky to have. She has been a friend for a very long time, and uh, along with a lot of other friends, and will continue to be a friend for a very long time. But then he was asked about the collapse of his marriage. Had he been faithful to Diana? Yes. Until it became irretrievably broken down. Us both having tried. What exactly did that mean? Had he been faithful or not? What was meant to be a PR victory turned into a PR disaster for the already floundering prince. And the following morning, Jonathan Dimbleby himself is interviewed on Sky News. The prince, I'm quite certain, was um, under the impression that I was asking him about his unfaithfulness with Camilla Parker Bowles, and that's what he was answering. But I tried to make that marriage work. Only when it was dead, irretrievably broken, um, did I uh, then um, take comfort with my very close friend. And there's no question in your mind that the unfaithfulness related only to Camilla Parker? No, no question whatsoever. Within hours, the Prince of Wales's private secretary calls a bombshell press briefing. For the first time, Charles admits that he did have an affair with Camilla. It made Diana seem unassailable, proved everything that she'd been saying was true. Weeks later, in July 1994, Camilla loses her mother, Rosalind Shand. Grief-stricken, she flees to Portugal, leaving her husband behind. His wife's absence gives Andrew Parker Bowles the time to reflect on the state of their marriage, and he decides he can no longer see a life with Camilla. Andrew and Camilla Parker Bowles have been living apart for two years, enjoying an apparent open marriage. But it's thought the situation became increasingly difficult after Prince Charles's television interview with Jonathan Dimbleby. Camilla's husband, Andrew, has been the butt of media jibes ever since. Former silver stick in waiting to the Queen, so dutiful he laid down his wife for his country. Now the marriage between Camilla and her husband is soon to be over. The couple, after 21 years of marriage, decide to divorce. Things just couldn't get any worse. Or could they? They do. In 1995, Princess Diana, then still very much the darling of the British public, agrees to a no-holds-barred interview with the journalist Martin Bashir for a primetime edition of BBC Panorama. Phil Craig again. I think by the time Diana sits down with Martin Bashir, she's separated. There's no divorce. She's still having a pretty successful public life. The interview remains mired in controversy. Years later, it was found that Martin Bashir had used fake personal documents to help secure the interview. There's an entirely separate story about Martin Bashir and what he was telling Diana, that she was being spied on, that her phone was being tapped, that people close to her were being paid. And that fed a paranoia, which I think, at the beginning, one could understand in Diana, but I think by the end, it had genuinely become a problem. However, none of this was known at the time, and 23 million people tuned in to watch. We were all on the edge of our seats. Would she settle old scores with her nemesis, Camilla? We weren't disappointed when Diana delivered a quote which she had obviously rehearsed, and many of the British public can recite word for word. There were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Like her husband, she used the interview to clear the air. Diana is again headline news around the world. And like her husband, she admitted adultery, in her case with former cavalry officer James Hewitt. Diana said she didn't want a divorce, that her husband hadn't discussed it, but she said she had no doubt who was to blame. The Princess of Wales said she didn't think she would be queen and wasn't sure that the prince would be king, but she denied claims that she was out to destroy the monarchy. The scale of the crisis is now gripping the palace ever tighter, even catching out our own Simon McCoy. Things were far worse than anybody had been reporting up until then. And it laid out very, very clearly just how desperately unhappy those two were and how bad things had got. The Diana effect was massive. There was huge sympathy for her. You know, she was the most popular person in this country. 
married to the least popular person. And there is something unedifying about people washing their dirty linen in public in the way that they did. But I think both of them felt there was nothing left to do. Someone did know what to do. The Queen. I think the Queen realised that the breakup of the marriage of her eldest son, of the second in line to the throne, caused massive problems for the monarchy. And, and as such, as monarch, she was the one who said to Charles, look, that you, need to, you need to get this divorce through. She was desperately worried about what was going on. If there was blame to be pointed to anyone, it was at Charles and, of course, at Camilla. Prince Charles listens attentively and agrees to the divorce, ordered by his mother. The degree in ISI was granted and the divorce finalised on the 28th of August, 1996. Diana will move on, but lose the protective shield of the officers who kept the paparazzi at bay. For Charles, he still enjoys the protection of the firm, the royal family and his mother, but at a cost. Will that cost be to lose the love of his life, Camilla, forever? Charles assures his mother that when the time comes, he will do his duty as king alone. Crisis averted. But almost exactly a year later, on the 31st of August, 1997, a tragic turn that nobody could ever have expected. We're just receiving the, uh, the sad news here at Sky Centre. Confirmation from our very own Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, who's uh, in the Far East at the moment, that Diana, Princess of Wales, has in fact been killed in that car accident in Paris uh, just a few hours ago. Our head of news called me in the early hours of that Sunday morning. Dodi had died. Diana was in a motor car with her companion of recent days, Dodi Fayed. The motor car Diana, was in injured but stable. Could I make my way into the studio? I grabbed a jacket and dashed out of the door into the night. In Paris, the princess was being taken from the wreckage and rushed to a hospital in the southeast of the capital. First medical reports indicated that she was suffering from concussion, a broken arm and cuts to her thighs. It later emerged that the princess had suffered massive chest injuries. There had been extreme concern that uh, Diana was very seriously injured when she was taken from the, wreck the wreckage. There was a, a news blackout to all intents and purposes for a significant amount of time. Um, confirmation from the interior minister from Paris for a short time. And uh, now there is confirmation that Diana, Princess of Wales, has died. She died at 4 a.m. after going into cardiac arrest. That, according to doctors at the hospital in Paris, Diana. Princess of Wales is dead. Balmoral Castle and a shocked Charles called Camilla as soon as he heard that Diana had died. He didn't know how to tell his sons, Princes William, now 15, and 12-year-old Harry, that they'd lost their mother. Simon McCoy. When Diana died, it was rock bottom for both of them. And I, I think you could see it on Charles's face. Anybody who says he wasn't affected by Diana's death needs to look at the pictures. Uh, and look at what he did. He went straight to Paris. He brought the body of his ex-wife home. Uh, you know, he, he, he was as dutiful as it, as it was possible to be at the time. And I don't think that any criticism could be leveled to him for it, but at the time, the public blamed him for Diana's death, blamed him for the entire mess, uh, and, he, and he shouldered that. How did this tragedy look for him? Would he be blamed? Would Camilla? Next time on Queen Camilla for the love of Charles. Operation putting on the Ritz. Camilla, the fight back begins. Here we go, I think. Here we go. This has been worked out to the nth degree and very carefully worked out on the back of public reaction. But not only the public, before they marry, the Queen too. There was some concern in the early days that the Queen had not been fully supportive of the marriage. You can listen to all episodes now. Queen Camilla, For the Love of Charles, is a Sky News podcast production presented by me, Kay Burley.
The producer is Soila Aparicio. Assistant producers are Alex Eden and Lily Thomas. Sound design is by James Bradshaw. Rob Mulhern is the exec producer and Paul Stanworth, the editor. <laughs>